Good afternoon, members of parliament, support staff, radio listeners, TV viewers, and those following various, via various, various forms of media. Welcome to this meeting of the Committee of Public Health, Social Development, and Labor number three of today, Wednesday, May the 10th, 2023. I would like to give a special welcome to the Honorable Minister of Public Health, Social Development, Labor, Mr. Omar Atli, and the Honorable Minister of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports, Dr. Anders Rudolph Samuel. Also a welcome to their respective staff. We've established a quorum of 11 members. Please stand for a moment of silence. I've received notice of lateness from the Member of Parliament, Peterson. Do we have any other notifications at this time? No? Thank you, Members of Parliament. And we have as agenda points for this meeting, discussion on proposals. Uh, first of all, there's three agenda points. First agenda is discussion on proposals to curb the, phenom the phenomenon of vaping amongst the youth. This is IS 502, dated February 23rd, 2023. Second agenda point is a discussion with the Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor on HIV AIDS on St. Martin. And three, discussion with the Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor on the National Health Insurance Universal Coverage. This is IS 645, dated May 10th, 2021. Agenda points one and three were requested by the Member of Parliament, Westcott Williams. We go over to agenda point one. Parliament received a letter from the Member of Parliament, Westcott Williams, on February 23rd, 2023, IS 502-2223, with the request that a meeting of this committee be convened with this agenda point. The presence of the Minister of VSA, as well as the Minister of ECYS, were also requested. All Members of Parliament have received a copy of this document via email, and it can also be found on the P drive, hence today's meeting. At this time, I would like to give the floor to the requester of this meeting for a brief elucidation of her request. MP Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and a uh, good afternoon to you. A good afternoon to my colleagues. A good afternoon to the ministers present, Minister Otley and Minister Samuel. And, of course, our support staff, as well as the support staff accompanying the ministers here this afternoon and the persons in the Tribune, those viewing online, listening, and viewing this meeting. Thank you for the introduction to my request for this meeting. Indeed, the first agenda point is one regarding e-cigarettes and vaping amongst our youth. In my letter of February the 22nd of this year, to which the chairperson of the committee referred, I outlined for both ministers the issue confronting us, the issue of vaping amongst our youth, as reported extensively not only on St. Martin, but throughout the world. The, in my letter of February 22nd, 2023, I not only outlined and asked the minister, ministers regarding their position and sentiments on this phenomenon, but I also outlined the many ways, in my opinion, that exist for the government and the ministers to at least start and take some kind of action as far as the curbing of this phenomenon of vaping amongst our youth, our youth is concerned. I would want to quote from my letter just the parts that reference to some of the areas that the government has, some of the items that the government has at its disposal to curb and address the issue of vaping and e-cigarettes, and I mentioned the tobacco ordinance, an existing ordinance, old nevertheless, but there is this Lansford Ordining Beperking Tabaksgebruik, that's one thing. The so-called Commodities Act, Warenverordening, 
There is an LBA on the labeling regulations, LBA, etiquetering, and of course we have our General Public Health Act. I indicated to the ministers in my letter of February that in my opinion, the Commodities Act of St. Martin provides the possibility to establish regulations on e-cigarettes by a national, a general national decree in the interest of public health. And I continue to mention that these regulations to be issued could include import, labeling, and sale. And then I mentioned several areas that I believe the government could employ in the matter as mentioned before. But as correctly indicated by the, by the chairperson, by your person, Mr. Chairman, this letter registered on the IS-502 of this parliamentary year is of course available to all members of parliament. And in addition to that, I asked some questions of the ministers pertaining to this very same matter. And what I wanted to get from the, the government and the ministers and ministries involved was a sense of urgency whether the government shares the sense of urgency that many on St. Martin, including myself, share. And I therefore want to thank the minister of VSA who responded to the questions that I posed in my, in my letter to him. So what I would like the minister to do today is to go in to these answers. Because while I am grateful for the answers, I would like now, and I think the answers by the minister were of the 31st of uh, March of this year, and so I would like to know now if any steps, any further steps have been taken, if anything further has been done with what the minister, with what the minister responded to me. So if that is included in the presentation that the minister will give, I would be, I would be very happy to take note of that, just to remind the ministries and the public at large that of my questions, which I will do now, and then determine in how far the answers of the minister give some more information than those received on the 31st of March. So my questions were- um, MP, MP Westcott. Um, yes, sir. The, I understand it's part of your elucidation. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest, um, rather than going through all the questions, we have the presentation from the minister and I allow you to speak first immediately after the presentation of the minister where you can go over the questions and those that were not answered, then we go into questioning. Could okay. the idea now would have been an elucidation to okay. your request. Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, okay, then just let me not go into the answers provided thus far, but just the one, two, three, four questions, just that we can put those out there. Okay. And then not only myself, but other members of parliament can say, indeed, that one was answered. And you, you see what I'm saying? Just so the four questions that I have that I posed and which were answered by the minister, but I would like to repeat those questions very specifically now. And so I thank you and I will continue. So my questions were to the minister, do you concur that vaping is an undesirable and dangerous phenomenon, especially amongst our youth? If you do, do you concur that it can and should be addressed urgently by one of the means mentioned above, to which I referred earlier? If not by one of the means mentioned by me, what then does the minister and ministry recommend be done if it is considered an urgent matter? And then I wanted to know what is government's view on smoking and updating the ordinance limiting tobacco use, the LV beperking tabaksgebrek. Those were the four specific questions following my elucidation in the letter. And I thank you for the opportunity to introduce my request to have the ministers here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Um, ministers, you've heard the elucidation, and indeed we will see if uh, most, if not all of those questions are covered in your presentation. And as I just indicated, in case some have been missed, I would then give the floor to MP Westcott Williams to pose those that might have been missed, and then we open the floor to the rest of the members within the committee. Uh, to which minister shall I give the floor first? It will be the Honorable Minister Rudolph Samuel. You have the floor. 
Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the Secretary General, and good afternoon to the members of Parliament. Good afternoon to my colleague and his support staff, and also to my support that is here, the Secretary General of the Ministry. Good afternoon to those sitting in the Tribune, and all those listening to us by whichever medium. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, on Saturday, March 25th, 2023rd, the Honorable Member Minister of Justice, Anna E. Richardson, and the Mem Minister of ECYS, Education, Culture, and Sports, myself, met with the Alpha Leo Club of St. Martin and the St. Martin Youth Parliament to discuss the usage of nicotine devices among the youth of St. Martin. The ministers were presented with a vaping proposal prepared by the students with the aim to propose several solutions in tackling the issue. The proposal also included a survey depicting a percentage of youth that engage in vaping. During the conversation, the students spoke about the ease of access to nicotine devices. To demonstrate this, one of the students bought a vape device at a local supermarket, though in the presence of a parent. All parties agreed that it was imperative that for laws to be updated in order to prohibit the sale of nicotine devices to the youth and have these enforced. Both clubs have the intention to host school conventions as well as a media campaign aimed at showing the negative impacts of using nicotine devices and with the goal to reduce its usage among their peers. So the discussion related to vaping continues, Mr. Chairman, to be high not only among the youth but also high on the agenda of Parliament as well as the government of St. Martin. In my last response to the Parliament, which was during the 2023 budget debate, I informed the members of Parliament that I saw the need to engage in an interministerial approach. I also informed Parliament that the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports, that we are engaging schools by providing them with information on vaping, its risk, and the possible signals that a student might be vaping, which I believe um, they already know. The suggested approach sent to me in a letter dated February 22nd, 2023, from the Honorable Member of Parliament, MP Sarah Westcott-Williams, is well taken. I do concur with the Honorable MP Westcott that vaping is a dangerous phenomenon for our youth and also for others. For that reason, I have gotten the support of my colleague ministers of VSA, TEAT, and Justice to agree with the interministerial approach which is necessary to ensure that we are making adequate use of our resources and that we all, that we have all as partners um, would be able to sit around the table and address this concern. The approach focuses on ensuring that the health of our youth is safeguarded. Secondly, it is essential that we create a commodity-wide awareness campaign very specifically among our school pop population. The engagement of our schools as key stakeholders will be vital in ensuring that the message gets to the target group. Finally, as Minister of Education, Culture, and Sports, I am advocating also that a necessary law is in place to prohibit the sale of vaping devices to minors. We cannot only leave it by having a law in place, so we must also ensure that the law is enforced with all the necessary consequences thereof. I am also supporting that we utilize the platforms already established and also those of the youth 
to continue the dialogue to seek solutions in the interest of our youth and our children. Mr. Chairman, with this, I will await any questions from the members of parliament. Thank you, Minister. Next, we go to Minister Omar Atli. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the honorable members of parliament, my support staff, my honorable colleague. Um, the Minister of Education touched on the plan and the interministerial committee that will be formed to tackle this. I would like to just speak on it um, on a VSA aspect. In 2022, the Ministry of VSA approved a 10-year strategic plan for the prevention and control of non-communicable disease called NCD Multi-Sectorial Action Plan 2021 to 2030. Tobacco use is one of the four key risk factors in developing NCDs. E-cigarettes should also be treated, should also be regulated as it contains nicotine. This has the same negative consequence as a regular cigarette. There are e-cigarettes that contain nicotine and contains addictive properties which can lead to respiratory and cardiovascular health problems and potential risk of injuries. In the same manner as it is not permitted to smoke regular cigarettes indoors, in indoors, in establishments, schools, or healthcare facilities, this, restric this restriction should be included, should include vaping. The secondhand smoke has the same negative consequence the secondhand smoke of vaping so this is um, also proven many persons think because it's odorless that the secondhand smoke of vaping does not affect those around you but it does so this is very important um, plans for regulation the inspectorate of VSA via the interministerial committee will be requested to explore the possibilities to establish further regulations on e-cigarettes this will include stricter regulations related to import labeling and sales of e-cigarettes, especially amongst our youth. This will be this will be need to establish. This will be needed to be established in the LVM to the Commodities Act. Plans for education and um, you know outreach. The Ministry of VSA plans to improve education about vaping by public health awareness campaigns about the risk of tobacco use, exploring the possibilities to reinstate the Healthy School Program. One element of this program will be to edu educate school-going youth and teachers about the healthy behavior, including the risk of vaping, implementing and enforcing the prioritized element of tobacco control regulations, for example, no smoking in the workplace or hospitality setting. Plans for monitoring. The Ministry of VSA plans to conduct population surveys to assess scope of the problem and monitor trend of vaping among the youth and not and no current local, as no current local data is available at the moment. So what will we do? The plan is um, Health Steps Survey 2023. This survey will assess the prevalence of smoking and use of e-cigarettes amongst adults 18 to 69 as well. That is it, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to any questions from the members of Parliament. Thank you, Minister. I now look to MP Westcott Williams before opening the floor to others in terms of addressing any or maybe perhaps reiterating which of the particular questions in her letter were not addressed. So I'll give her that opportunity. And then after we open the floor to other members of the committee. MP Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Thank you once again, Mr. Chairman. And I thank both ministers for their responses. Look forward to receiving the presentation by the minister of VSA, the one that was just, unless it was done already, then I look forward to getting it via parliament. I heard from the Minister of Education that they received a proposal from the Alpha Leo Club, with whose representatives I too have met, by the way, and the Youth Parliament. But what I would like to ask of the Minister, if that proposal can be shared with Parliament, so the proposal received from the, from the youth, the, the Leo Club and the Youth Parliament. The, I am very pleased 
Mr. Chairman, to hear that government, like put in the letter from the Minister of VSA to me in response to my questions, um, consider vaping um, an issue. And as such, it is high on the agenda of um, government as well, and as is evident from these meetings of parliament as well. I am also very pleased to learn of the interministerial <coughs> approach and I ask actually both ministers, because the minister of VSA also referred to, for example, the last slide, which is on the monitor. And is there one? Has the interministerial group platform, has that been officially established as an interministerial approach, an interministerial group, sorry, for this particular item? That's one. Um, if it has if it has not been yet been done, is it the intention that that be formally established that there is an interministerial um, group, an interministerial consultation, whatever the official name would would be? If that has already been done, is there a plan of approach with steps and timelines to be taken? For example, mentioning the different items that I've heard this afternoon information, uh, meeting with, with, with schools, et cetera, et cetera. So is there a plan outlined? What comes when? So communication, I guess, would be ongoing. We're going to have the step survey in 2023. Um, when exactly? So if I could now just get some indications whether these items to be carried out. Um, what's the plan? What's the timeline? And what's the planning, e even roughly? These matters will take place in the second quarter. These, you know, so whatever information you have in terms of planning, that's what I would like to know now. How are these matters that are mentioned and those mentioned in the letter from the minister to me? What's the, what's the planning? What's the planning? And if, there is, if the government has any, um, any indication whether some of these things are going to cost money then, and um, what would the cost be? Is there a cost factor to any of the items mentioned by the ministers as the different steps to be taken to, to, to deal with this matter on, to deal with this matter of vaping, especially amongst our youth and in our schools um, on St. Martin? I refer to the minister, I think it was in the presence of the minister of, the v of VSA, the last time around regarding that alarming article that came out regarding Curacao. And that was the, the conclusion on Curacao that vaping is very, um, is very common even in the elementary schools, on the elementary level. And I had mentioned this, that was an article. Okay. I found this on the web, Chris. Okay, that's what we... Okay, so that's where it was probably found. But um, sorry about that. And Minister, I was saying um, that I had mentioned that. So, and I, and in fact, in fact, I mentioned that article of Curacao because of um, similar, similar news reaching me regarding St. Martin. St. Martin and our young, young students of elementary school age also engaging in vaping. That's a Fact. I got it firsthand, and based on that notification to me, I had asked if the government was aware of the article that came out um, regarding Curacao and their elementary school and the use of um, all kind of e-cigarettes on Curacao. So, um, Mr. Chairman, again, I want to thank the ministers for their responses and um, just a few questions that I ask in connection with those responses and look forward to the, um, to the answers. Thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Next, we have MP. Actually, I did receive a notification regarding Minister Samuel that I forgot to mention. Um, the Honorable Minister does have an engagement with um, His Excellency at three, and he did request if now that he's done his presentation and the rest of the staff would be present, if he can go to that meeting and if the meeting is still continuing, return or return when we adjourn. So I just want to give that notification that uh, minister, uh, you can be excused. And we thank you for your notification. We go now to the next member of parliament, that will be MP De Weaver.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to the ministers and their support staff here, viewing and listening public, and my colleagues as well. Um, this one is just a very um, quick clarification, I believe, uh, because we're talking about youth vaping. And when you look at the Health Step survey coming up in 2023, I just want to make sure that expectations are managed because the survey refers to 18 to 69, but youth, you know, in my uh, interpretation of it would be those persons under 18, which is where I think the concern is coming in for um, teenagers or even maybe younger possibly using vaping. So I just want to make sure that there is um, a proper understanding in terms of the shared responsibilities across the ministries, ECYS and ECYS in terms of cooperation of collecting the data for the persons under the age of 18, and then um, the Ministry of VSI using that information uh, to report back to, to Parliament with the concerns of underage vaping. At the same time, I... I would just wanted to get maybe an update on whether there is a policy in place for smoking in public areas because everyone could smoke anywhere um, as it is on the island. So I, it kind of feels like, you know, if we're going to go around policy setting when it comes to cigarettes, uh, banning indoor smoking, whether or not that will be inclusive of the same thing with vaping. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP. And next we have MP Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to everyone. I just had a quick question, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the Minister of Education in particular, because I understood that the proposal was given in. The youth have been, um, they have basically taken their future into their own hands. They have been applying pressure not only to government but to parliament over the last couple of years, and I am extremely proud of them. I would like to know, however, to the Ministry of Education, has the ministry reached out to schools, guidance, counsel guidance counselors uh, in particular? Because we're talking about vaping. Um, that means we're also talking about addiction, and we're talking about mental health issues. And the schools need as much support as they can possibly get at the ground level. And so... Um, I am happy to hear that there will be an interministerial committee be informed. However, I'd like to know if communication between the Ministry of Education and the schools um, regarding this in particular, um, if any communication has, uh, has happened and if there are any real um, specific detailed plans to assist schools in particular with, uh, with this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Duncan. Are there any other members of parliament? MP George Pantaflet. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the chair, my colleagues in parliament, Honorable Minister of VSR, the one of education left. Those that are sitting in the tribune, Mr. Chairman, um, this might sound like a rhetorical question and so on, but the fact is we are talking about the issue of vaping and the danger that it, it has uh, for our youth those that are under age. So, Chairman, today my question is, how dangerous is uh, smoking for our youth, Mr. Chairman? Has a survey been done on that? A survey has been done to see exactly, Mr. Chairman, what we can compare to vaping, which one you consider more dangerous or whatever, Mr. Chairman? That's just a question I have now. Thank you very much. Thank you, MP Pantaflet. Are there any other members of parliament? I see no need. Um, Minister, I also just wanted to bring uh, a couple points to your attention on this topic. I saw mention made of the commodities ordinance or changes uh, perhaps to be made to that. Um, however, in also researching this topic, there's another ordinance that I think I would recommend the Ministry of VSA also look at, and that's the, in English, it's called the National Decree, uh, not an ordinance, but it's a National Decree on the laboring, labeling of foodstuffs. Um, the reason why I think we should also take a look at that ordinance, because with the concerns being expressed not just about vaping or tobacco products, perhaps it's time for St. Martha to consider, like what most countries have, their own national labeling for all of these type of products. I think um, that would require, and what is fortunate about it being within a national decree, it is something that the government is able to work on, on advice of the Council of Advice, because it's El Beham. And what we should consider is creating our own labels that factor the issues 
especially in our country. If the concern being expressed so much is about the attention of young people avoiding these products, then perhaps our national label where the regular tobacco product focuses on the Surgeon General's warning about lung cancer, et cetera, those dangers are stated on all of the tobacco products. Our label can maybe stress on the danger of the youth using this product, a warning that as a business you will be fined for doing this and this, that it can be wrapped around the product. It's easy for compliance because what you do, any uh, entity that brings in the product has to purchase such labels from the government and any product that is not found with the stamp, the retailer can be fined as well as where it is sourced. So I think maybe just a look at that or at that national decree to see where you can now create labels that we feel need to warn for what our society needs might be very helpful. Um, I also want to mention, of course, indeed, that the the it is literally a trend um, when you look at the numbers in, involved in the cigarette industry versus vaping. The growth of that industry, according to what I was able to find, you're seeing a, heart, a huge growth, 30.4% projected between now and 2030. However, to also add a certain context, the global vaping market is $22.8 billion. The global cigarette market, not counting cigars, is $1.1 trillion. So while it is a growing trend, the most prevalent issue that we still have when it comes to tobacco use is with cigarettes. So I think we should make sure that whatever policies can come out, address both as much as possible. We have the opportunity where this is a new trend that you can still curtail by means of labeling and all of those different um, things that the minister has mentioned. So I think that those are the two points I also, especially for the minister of VSA, wanted to bring to the attention of the minister. And of course, not, not to uh, miss the fact that creating our own labels brings a new income for the government of St. Martin and might be a different strategic way of getting, um, uh, of kind of indirectly taxing your tobacco and for that matter, liquor products in St. Martin if you choose to go that route. Uh, minister, we've received various questions from the committee uh, members of the committee, we also have two additional agenda points and the minister earlier did ask to be excused. I would like to suggest we adjourn this agenda point so that the ministers can return uh, for answers and then we move on to the second and then third agenda point for this meeting. So at this time, being that, uh, being that for the next agenda point, we do not require the presence of the minister of of education, okay, so if anyone, no, no one else, uh, we will actually excuse the SG for a moment, so I'll adjourn for two minutes to excuse the uh, staff from the ECYS ministry, and we will continue on with the Minister of VSA. Meeting adjourned for two minutes.
Yep. Good afternoon once again, members of parliament. We had concluded uh, and actually adjourned rather, not concluded the first agenda point. And we now go over to the second agenda point. I, this is the discussion with the Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor on HIV AIDS on St. Martin. The Committee of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, the Committee of VSA in Parliament in its meeting of, uh, number six of Thursday, June 16, 2022, of the parliamentary year 21-2022, met with the representatives of the St. Martin AIDS Foundation concerning the financial and public health implications as it relates to HIV AIDS on Dutch St. Martin. At the end of the meeting, the committee agreed to send all documentation received regarding the meeting and the subject matter to the Minister of VSA, who is here with us today. This was done by letter of June 17, 2022, also notifying the minister that he would be invited to a meeting of the committee to discuss the treatment and strategy plan for the handling of HIV AIDS on St. Martin. At this time, I would like to give the floor to the Minister of VSA, Omar Atli, once again, for any opening remarks or presentation on this subject. Minister Atli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be very brief, and I look forward to having a fruitful discussion with the members of parliament. Over the years, St. Martin have moved from having a HIV AIDS program management team who, has solely, who was solely responsible for developing and executing the multi-annual interministerial HIV strategic plan of St. Martin. These activities are now expected to be executed by the individual ministries. As such, the Ministry of VSI is amongst others responsible for policies aimed at securing access to care and treatment. This is done through example, possible subsidies to existing organization, in inclusion of medical packages, possible agreements with existing care facilities to guarantee affordable provision of care. We recognize, however, that there's always possibility for improvement, for example, a main challenge remains data collection from the executing entities. CPS, along with the St. Martin AIDS Foundation, is currently busy working on an agreed upon structure for reporting. Moving forward, we plan to improve on surveillance and data reporting with STI and HIV. Update and enforce update and enforcement on public health legislation. Invest in digital infrastructure to facilitate disease reporting. Update current draft sexual reproductive health policy to ensure that it includes current realities and has the buy-in of key stakeholders. Very important. Continue with the routine STI screening among commercial sex workers. Structure care and treatment coverage for persons living with HIV, with HIV AIDS on St. Martin. As stated, Mr. Chairman, I had, it's just a very short presentation overview. I look forward to a healthy discussions with the members of parliament. Thank you for that introduction, Honorable Minister. Members of parliament, as discussed, we would be able to have a discussion with the minister on this topic. You've heard the introductory remarks. To which member of the committee can I give the floor? MP Westcott Williams, you have the floor. Thank you once again, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the minister for his introduction on this subject. And in the first, um, I guess the first page, the first slide, the minister outlined things that can be done to assist in the treatment, education, et cetera, regarding the HIV AIDS disease the what i what i kind of missed from the presentation is the the alarm that has been sounded by especially the doctor at the time who took most of the brunt for the treatment of hiv aids patients in terms of um, availability cost etc etc so I would like the minister to go into some of the items mentioned 
that are being provided, <coughs> that are given access, and very, very, very specifically. And in addition to that, I heard of uh, a cooperation with CPS and the AIDS Foundation, but how much further is that? Where, where and how is this cooperation? Because the feeling that we got was that there is not, or maybe not sufficient attention for HIV AIDS any longer. And that those who are suffering or who are combating the disease, um, not everybody can, because of status or otherwise, can receive the necessary help, assistance, treatment, medication, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of picture that was painted to us. And so I would really like to know what, what in essence is government doing? I understand you can do everything. I understand there are <coughs> steps to be taken, but very concretely what is, what, is, what is happening now from a government's perspective would be my question hearing um, the minister's response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If further elaboration can be given where that is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. And I will turn the chair to M Member of Parliament, turn the word over to Member of Parliament, Ludmila De Weaver. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon again to everyone. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think MP Westcott Williams is being very nice about it because when, I don't know how long ago it was, but when it was Dr. Von Osh that came in, who actually was, he wasn't so much as sounding the alarm, more so as, uh, making a whole lot of noise. Um, he, in, in the right way, for the right reasons. And the way, the way I interpreted it was that if something wasn't done by the time he left, which was last year, September, beginning of October, uh, and maybe this was me just, you know, over-exaggerating, it was sort of like you kind of felt like you were going to have this outbreak of HIV positivity that would happen. That's the way it came across. And that's what I mean by that um, MP Westcott Williams is being very nice. So I remember getting emails directly to me and trying to assist into uh, answering the doctor and giving him time and attention and passing it on to parliament to ensure that this was given time. You even had persons um, from St. Martin that live abroad that are, that are living with HIV that came here and did presentations as well, part of their um, outreach and education surrounding it. So my question then is, who is there to take the place of Dr. Von Osch that he's no longer there? Because Dr. Von Osch, what he was doing was financing the, the testing and the care of undocumented persons and persons that were uninsured. So the concern that I felt and the fear that I felt was if no one's gonna take over taking care of those persons from doc with Dr. Von Osh, with his foundation, he was doing that, who is there to take the place? I am not saying make everything the burden of government, but public health is the burden of, gov of government when you're dealing with something like HIV. So. That's what I want to see to find out from the Ministry of Health. What is what? What was their dialogue with Dr. Von Osch? Because we were we were we were made a, we were made aware of it. Um, who is now going to pick up the testing and care for the persons that are living with HIV that are undocumented, undocumented and uninsured? Because that is very much uh, an issue that we have, which was raised by Dr. Von Osch. And then lastly, I remember when I first moved back to the island, it was my Hoysars, my doctor, that was doing the testing for the sex workers. Um, and I would like to know who is doing that now. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP De Weaver. Next, MP Gums. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and apologies for my voice, <clears throat> getting over a sore throat. But it's good that MP Westcott and MP DeWeaver said most of what I wanted to say. I think I just have one question for the minister, which is what is the availability or the coverage possibility uh, for PrEP for persons that are having risky sex within the community um, who don't want to use protection or whatever, and so this could be a step to prevent them from contracting um, HIV? And just a comment that I think actually the Minister of Education should have been here. Because a sexual reproductive health policy will not go anywhere unless you have a comprehensive 
progressive sex education curriculum in schools, public and private. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point again, and I await the minister's answers. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. Just to clarify on that latter point, the request from the committee was the minister of ASL. But I understand what, what you're saying. I just want to make that clear that that was the request of the committee. Um, are there any? Yes, we have MP William Marlin. You have. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. A hearty good afternoon to the minister and his support staff and to colleagues and visitors in the public tribune, those listening at home. Mr. Chairman, I don't have uh, in this opening segment, so to speak, uh, much more to add to what already has been uh, questions that have already been posed. But um, <clears throat> unless it slipped me, uh, is there any documentation available, not in terms of its Peter, Mary, Harry, or Paul, but um, there are X amount of cases on the island, and particularly since mention was made of Dr. Fanosh, um, personally financing the either testing and care for some of the particularly undocumented people, how big is that group? Um, is it a group of 10? Is it a group of 20? Uh, is there a growing trend in it? Are we keeping statistics? Uh, can we say in 2010 there were 40 cases in 2011? there were 35 or 45. So is there a growing trend or is it on the decrease? Um, because depending on who you talk to, uh, it is almost non-existent on the island. And then when you have a, another conversation with someone else, they tell you, whoa, this thing is getting out of hands. If you guys don't put a lid on it, uh, we can uh, be in serious trouble. So what information can the ministry provide in terms of statistics, numbers, and a comparison with the undocumented community? I right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP William Marlin. Next, MP Pantafler. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my colleague, William Marlin, basically hit the nail on the head. I also want to add that I think it's important because, again, also I, I have, it, it is as if HIV AIDS kind of disappeared because there was a time uh, in the past where you would hear commercials and so on, you would see it on TV, newspapers about the issue of AIDS, its dangers and so on, how you should protect yourself and so on. So definitely, uh, based on what my colleague, Amy Marlin said, it is this, as if it's almost non-existent. Um, my, my suggestion, Mr. Chairman, would be, um, because I think the organizations, and unfortunately I can't even remember their names anymore or name, but that in time past you would hear them, you know, making their voices heard as to what has taken place, but it, it, it is almost dormant. So my, my suggestion advice would be that these organizations be contacted and start again, um, uh, bring it to the forefront that uh, the issue of HIV AIDS has not died out. It, it is still amongst us. And what information can be given in order to uh, uh, assist persons in protecting themselves in, in, in what you call um, uh, uh, unprotected behavior, let me put it this way, but to really come out and um, bring the awareness again that this does exist and definitely it is something that can be, um, and I think the reason why maybe you don't hear much about it because um, persons can live a long time uh, many years are almost a natural life with, uh, with, with, with the virus, so therefore maybe that's why it's not being discussed as much, but I think that they should start again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Pantaflet. Next, MP Rumo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A pleasant good afternoon to you. A pleasant good afternoon to our minister here, his support staff, my colleagues, the viewing and listening public. I just have um, one question as it pertains to education and educating our youth. I know that uh, the Red Cross has a number of programs within the secondary schools as it pertains to um, boys and girls. They separate them. They have real talk for the young men, and they have um, girl power. 
My question to the ministry is, are there any programs that the ministry have within the schools as it pertains to educating our youth as far as safe sex is concerned? And if not, what are your plans to have these implemented? As some of my colleagues already mentioned, in the presentation given by Dr. Vanosh, indeed it was a bit grim, as it seemed as if once uh, the doctor would leave, there would be no um, assistance, there would be no information for others to have and to carry on. So I just would like to know, what are the plans of the ministry moving forward as, as far as it pertains to educating our youth on these topics? Thank you. Thank you, MP Ramu. Are there any other members of parliament wishing the floor at this time? I see no need. Um, Minister, I do have two additional points, and I think I want to bring this a bit from the budgetary perspective. Um, in the last three budgets, so 2020, sorry, 2021, 2022, and the recently passed 2023, we've seen the budget post for the allocation of subsidy to the AIDS Foundation decrease from 390,000 guilders to subsequently 200,000 and again 200,000. In the elucidation of the budgets where the cut took place, it said that uh, cuts were needed in order to comply with liquidity support and CFT requirements. Now to be fair, this was a general statement about subsidies that were being cut within our budget. However, I think it's still remarkable that we see an effect, because here we are discussing this type of topic. We know a foundation that is at the forefront of helping with this topic. And in the budget at the time, we were told these types of subsidies are cut because we need to comply basically with CFT. Um, I think that's a remarkable thing that all of us as members of parliament have to also keep in mind, where whenever we're faced with these situations where, especially at that time, when you're talking 2021 budget, it was do it or else, no liquidity support, no SSRP. These things have consequences on the very topics that we as members of parliament want the government to execute. So I'd like to ask if the minister has any plans within the 2024 budget to maybe re-engage with the foundation to see if this subsidy is still adequate and if there's room within the 2024 budget to bring it back to its previous levels um, based on what I saw before, it always used to be around the 390,000 guilders. Um, in addition to that, there's another budget post under 43489-7110 that kind of groups together various activities with regards to um, improvement in health, um, PAHO, mental health, big registratie, and so on. It also mentions HIV slash AIDS medicatsi. Um, can we get some information on how the uh, the topic of HIV AIDS fits within the context of that project. Um, so is it now maybe that we found a strategic way where unfortunately a cut had to be made to the subsidy side of things, but then the government is also taking on some of the activities in helping um, prevent, inform, et cetera, related to HIV AIDS. Because this is the other side of the budget that I do find encouraging, that while on one side maybe a foundation was not able to get as much subsidy, we see that the government has still found a way to include projects related to HIV AIDS. It says medicatsi, so I don't know if that means it's a sort of a subsidy, acquiring, a policy. I would be very interested to hear the plans in that regard as well. Uh, Minister, you've um, received various questions regarding this topic. We have a third agenda point to which you would also be um, would be present for. Uh, I don't know if you're able to go into the answers to these questions right away. Probably, I don't know if you need a, a little time or should we go into the next agenda point? Need some time? Okay. Uh, do you have an idea how much time you may need? 30 minutes. Okay, members of parliament, we will return at 10 minutes to 4 p.m. to allow the minister 30 minutes to return with the answers to the question. Meeting adjourned.
Good afternoon once again, members of the Committee of Public Health, Social Development, and Labor. Welcome back to this committee meeting where, as a first agenda point, we had adjourned, which was related to the discussion on proposals to curb the phenomenon of vaping amongst our youth. Uh, we will tentatively return to that once the answers from the Minister of ECYS are received. We are now at the agenda point discussion with Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor on HIV AIDS on St. Martin. And for that topic, the minister has returned with the answers to questions posed by members of... Um, we'll, since we're still in agenda two, I will get these answers if you're, you're prepared for those. And then we'll, uh, the thing is we're still waiting for the minister of ECYS. So we may go to agenda three and then back to one, depending on when we get those answers, yeah? So at this time, Minister, I would ask for you to answer the questions from Agenda Point 2 and just uh, hold on to the answers from Agenda Point 1. We'll get to those. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to the questions of MP Sarah Westcott. What is Ms., um, the alarm that has been sounded by the doctor at the time who took the brunt of the treatment? Um, the HIV program continues to provide education and services and his former clinic still provides cares, care to patients. Um, there is a cooperate, cooperation between CPS and the AIDS Foundation. Is there a cooperation between CPS and the AIDS Foundation? Um, where and how is this cooperation? The feel is now that there's not sufficient attention. There is close collaboration between CPS and the um, AIDS Foundation via subsidy, awareness, outreach, including girl power and real talk. What in essence is government doing? We are doing close collaborations with the outreach act activities and they also receive subsidies from the government. MP DeWeaver, who is there to take place of Dr. Take the place of Dr. Van Asch? Dr. Van Asch, um, his practice was sold to another GP. Dr. Simmons replaces Dr. Van Usch, who is currently doing the testing for sex workers. The brothels have agreements with GPs in which the sex workers are tested by weekly. Some are tested weekly, so they have their own arrangement with GPs. MP Gums, what coverage is possible for PrEP um, I don't know you were saying what or if coverage is possible, but coverage is indeed possible. Um, MP Marling, is there any documents available to show the amount of HIV AIDS persons um, on the island? No, at this moment, statistics is not available to give the exact amount of persons that are infected. At this time, um, how big is the undocumented AIDS group on St. Martin? So at this time, we do not have an exact amount. However, we are aware that 17 individuals are being managed by the St. Martin AIDS Foundation at this moment. MP Rumu, are there any programs that, ministry, that the ministry itself has within the schools? Well, the ministry itself, VSA, started the Girl Power. The ministry um, itself is taking part in Real Talk. This was developed under the auspices of Ministry of VSA and continue to be executed with the support of the Samaritan AIDS Foundation. MP Bryson, is there any plans to re-engage with um, foundations to see if subsidy is still adequate? Is there a room to increase the budget post? Can we get some information on how HIV AIDS has been developed in, the, in this project? Indeed, government has gone into an agreement with one of the pharmacies on St. Martin to be able to guarantee continuity of affordable ARV medication. This then contributes to have access to affordable medication. And that is the end of the questions. I look forward to any clarifications. Thank you, Minister. I see an additional question from Member De Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Minister, and your team for the answers. 
Um, I'm going to go back to my question on the screening for sex workers. Um, so I knew that when I came in that it was Dr. Mercure's clinic that did it. And I, and then, you know, in my, in my conversation with some MPs during the break, uh, we were going over as to, you know, why it was only Dr. Mercure. So not trying to, to make no, up the, the answer, but trying to go through with why every Animir Meishas or sex worker had to come to Dr. Mercury's clinic. So I don't know if I'm using the right definition of the, the employee, um, but I knew that they were going to Dr. Mercury, and that was on a specific day of the week that they had to go there because I also observed it. So when I, when I hear the answer that there's individual agreements with GPs, the way that it comes across to me is that it's kind of like up in the air. I just want to know that there is a firm policy in place attached possibly to the existence and the legality of these workers existing, um, of them being uh, in service, basically. Um, whether or not there is a concrete sort of record keeping of it, because it was like that in the, pla in the past. It was properly uh, controlled, so to say, in the past. And it was done specifically by Mercure Clinic. And I know that there was, um, because Dr. Mercur in the past was the one that was government uh, to do stuff with the police officers, to do um, assessment of, uh, of corpses, basically, to, to declare them what they are. So that's what I wanted to know in my answer. Who, it, now that you gave me my answer, then how has that policy changed from the days of Dr. Mercur being the only one to do it? to know GPs have agreements with them because then I want to know who is controlling. I hope that's clear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for that. I think Minister Atli is prepared to answer that question immediately, so I'll give him the floor. Yes, I'd just like to clarify, Dr. McCure was not the only one that did this. He was not. Different brothels had different arrangements with different doctors. And the staff is confirmed Dr. McCure was not the only one. He did it with specific brothels, but he was not the only one. And since then, different brothels had made different arrangements with other doctors. And then um, I think there was also a question re related any policy or procedure in that regard well, but that they have to follow, or is there a guideline or anything like that from government, if I understand? Or maybe I'll allow the MP to elab elaborate. No, then it's going back. Thank you for that, and thank you, Minister, for the answer. Um, it's just now that you're having, um, so even if it wasn't just Dr. Mercure, now that you know that we know that the policy is every doctor, they, every brothel has a agreement with the doctor, then is how is that information reported to the Ministry of ASA? How is that controlled? Because we're going right back around to HIV. So I just want to see where the control procedure comes into play with it. Is it the doctor's report back? Yep. They came in on the day they're supposed to because the minister said some come in weekly, some come in monthly. So how is that controlled and reported? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'll allow the minister once again. Yes. The GPs have an obligation to report, but they are only allowed to report uh, like reportable diseases. Of course, health information is privacy, but, you know. And anonymous for STI. Any other members of the committee? Yes, we have MP Ramu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one clarification as well. Um, my question had pertained to the girl talk and the um, girl power. As I know that the Red Cross um, executes, are they being funded or subsidized by government to do so? Because you said government started it and they execute for government on behalf of government. How does it work? Let me. Okay. Uh, I'll allow the minister. Mr. Yes. Mr. Chairman, can I? Allow my it's a committee meeting, so if okay. you would like a member to elaborate, that's also fine. Can you indicate? Okay, so it'll be Ms. Arnell. Just to clarify, so the Red Cross is not executing Girl Power nor Real Talk. That's executed by the St. Martin AIDS Foundation in collaboration with the Ministry of VSA, which started during sector health care affairs time. So, and the other question, what, is it subsidized by government? Is well, the program government, subsidized? The 
program is executed by government and the volunteers of St. Martin Aids Foundation support with the execution, okay. but the staff, everybody of CPS are the ones who are involved and, and go to the schools and, and actively execute the program. Okay. Thank you, yes. Clear? Okay, uh, any other members at this time on agenda point two? I see no need. Um, Minister, with that, I think we have uh, come to the conclusion of this agenda point. Uh, we thank you for the information you've provided and your response to the committee. With, mem <coughs> with that, members, we close this agenda point and go over to agenda point three. Agenda point three is a discussion with the Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor on the National Health Insurance Universal Coverage, that is IS 645, dated May 10th, 2021. Parliament received a letter from the Member of Parliament, Westcott Williams, on May 10th, 2021, that is again IS 645, with a request that a meeting of this committee be convened with the aforementioned agenda point. The presence of the Minister of VSI was requested, and as you know, he is here. All members have received a copy of this document via email, and it is also available on the P drive. Once again, I would like to give the opportunity for MP Westcott Williams, a requester of this meeting, to have a brief elucidation as to her request. Um, MP Westcott Williams, you'll uh, we'll have the elucidation, um, but the questioning would come after. That's clear? Thank you once again, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the Minister for the continuation of this meeting now under the agenda, the agenda point as requested national health insurance slash universal coverage. Coincidentally or not, my request for this meeting goes back exactly two years today. Two years, May 10th, 2021. IS 645 of the parliamentary year 2021, exactly two years. So at a time, my request to the chairperson of the Committee of Public Health, Social Development and Labor was as follows. I ask for a meeting in the presence of the minister to discuss the national health insurance universal coverage, as I mentioned. And I motivated this request with the following statement. Long time, so the national health insurance, long time on parliament's agenda, but not getting anywhere fast. Yet it is evident that healthcare reform is urgently needed and the healthcare funds are on the stress. End of that passage in my letter. Since the request for this meeting on several occasions in meetings with the minister, including the one on the budget as well as others, I have expressed my concern to the minister with respect to the status of health on St. Martin and health care. The, I have just been able, because we have received a copy of the presentation that the minister will be presenting in a moment or two, and I saw where the minister kind of gave an indication as to the trajectory of the general health insurance under the umbrella of national health reform. And going back to, I think the first year mentioned in the presentation by the minister is 2007. And dates are mentioned up until 2018. I think also to be added to that timeline should be the year 2019. The year 2019 is a very interesting year in the context of the general health insurance slash the general hospital project of St. Martin. Eventually, it is primarily these topics that led to a break in the coalition a fall of the government, subsequent elections in 2020, just as a matter for the record. However, my concern today has to do with, one, the 
trajectory for the general health insurance, Minister has announced publicly as per the 1st of January 2024. I have concluded that this is in line with the country package. I want the people of St. Martin to know that the steps to be taken in the context of the general health insurance and the date of January 1st, 2024 is part of the country package agreement. Where my concern is today, because I'll hear more from the minister on this trajectory, his cooperation with those executing the country package, et cetera, is with respect to what happens in the meantime. I stated to the minister, Mr. Chairman, some weeks ago, in, and I saw the, the minister at the time nor did, so I assume he is quite aware of the fact that the current medical coverage of St. Martin has a very peculiar coverage as far as <coughs> private persons are concerned. What is that peculiar coverage? A sole proprietorship, or no, a sole proprietor on St. Martin, the owner of a sole proprietor, cannot get coverage via the SZV medical insurance but an employee working for a sole proprietor can. On the other hand, the director of an NV is covered under the SZV medical insurance and not a sole proprietor, not a taxi driver, bus driver on his or her own. For the longest of while, Going back now to 2015, I slash we in Parliament have been told that this legislation to undo that situation, to either ensure them all, I can't say or no one, but to ensure them all rather, um, was in the make. Recently from the minister, Minister Otley, we have understood this preparation legislation is in the make. Mr. Chairman, now, unless the Council of Advice's website is out of date, is not up to date, let me put it that way, I would like to know where is this draft ordinance repairing that injustice for medical coverage? Where? So go in, and I hope it is not the expectation that this is going to come with the general health insurance, which with our fingers crossed, we are looking now that the country package has become involved, or the TWO rather, has become involved, that um, we are looking towards the 1st of January 2024. So I want to know where and how and how soon can that legislation be repaired, given coverage to Chaleika Monica, Chaleika Kappa, as far as medical insurance on St. Martin is concerned. But my, I have some questions, Mr. Chairman, but you asked just to give my elucidation, so I want to stress for the minister where my concern is at this moment. And of course, I had to highlight it, the 2019 um, year in Parliament. As we know, members in Parliament at the time rejected rejected the proposal for general health insurance through the general hospital under the bus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But today, we're all talking general health insurance for everybody, medical insurance for everybody on St. Martin. So I want to know how quickly can we get the one that is currently in place repaired so that amongst others, the independent proprietors, what we call sole proprietors, the Zelfstandigen, that we can get them covered under the SZV medical insurance. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to elucidate. Um, I had to add those little parts because, as I said, my request is of two years ago, and I would like to know the, um, where we stand today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. MP Westcott Williams. At this time, I'll give the floor to the Honorable Minister of ASR, Minister Omar Atli, once again, so that he can do the presentation, after which we go to the members of the committee. Uh, Minister Atli, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good day again to the honorable members of parliament. Um, indeed, this has been a long standing, a long journey, even before my time. However, if you notice, um, the talks of JHI and NHI is no longer applicable here. We now refer to what it is that we are selling, which is sustainable and affordable access to health care and wellness on St. Martin. In parentheses, I like to say, at least cares. Um, we move to the next slide. Today, I would like to inform you, the Central Committee, on what this project is about and what it is not. The objective of this project is not to introduce a mandatory health insurance for our people on St. Martin. The aim is to establish affordable, sustainable access to health care for people living on St. Martin. And I think that is one of the main reasons that it received so much restrictions or resistance in Parliament before that it was brought across as something mandatory and not seen as sustainable access to health care for people on St. Martin. Because of the current situation that we have, it is unsustainable. Therefore, changes in the health financing and access to health care is urgently needed. Here we illustrate, um, this was first designed in 2007 and then 2010 to be implemented. 2016, the first draft national ordinance review was sent to the SED. There were many concerns from the SED that did not allow it to push through. In 2018, the second um, national ordinance was sent to the said, And now um, I can proudly say that we have taken all of the concerns from the said, all of the previous concerns from members of parliament and stakeholders and put it together. We also have a list of changes that were made. So this is definitely not the same um, presentation that was presented before. Um, I would like to publicly thank Javier Fenner and the entire team for your tireless work in ensuring that this package meets the expectation and the culture of St. Martin. The current financial situation is unsustainable on St. Martin. Rising costs of OZR over the year 2010 to 2021, deficits as ZV management funds ZV funds in particular have depleted the reserves of reserve, reserves of SZV significantly, accumulatively creating a deficit of 400 million gillers. The, the composition of the population makes a financial challenge even worse. The small base indicates that we have too little young workforce covering for the elderly. The overrepresented growth of the people between the age of 40 to 60 will cause a significant increase in the healthcare costs, which cannot be absorbed when the resolves will melt away. Hold on a minute. If we understand this chart, we would see what we call the belly of the chart is ages 40 to about 60. If we look at the population of St. Martin, if you go lower with the younger population, it is slim, which means one, we have not reproduced enough. So therefore, the younger population will not be able to support the elder population. If you look at Curacao, they have a sort of a fat um, stigma going on in the Netherlands, which means that they are re producing. So this is something very important in order for us to take care because what this means is that the majority of our population will age and not much will be able to sustain it. This is very important. Currently, persons who desperately need health insurance don't have access to health insurance. Example of vulnerable people who do not have access, elderly, people above the age of 60 who are exempt from private insurance and some don't qualify for public funds. This is also a step that we take in the SZV um, 1B where we um, validify the 60 plus insurance to ensure, to ensure that they can be insured. 
People with pre-existing conditions are exempted from private insurance and some don't qualify for public funds. People who have reached a maximum of claims are exempted from private insurance and some, again, don't qualify for public funds. Families cannot insure their newborn children when they are born with serious disease or birth defects. To summarize, the current situation is unsustainable and the reforms are urgently needed. However, these reforms should not have adverse consequence for our population. In other words, the reforms will repair imperfections in our system without higher premiums for the majority while retaining the current entitlements. The reforms will lower the financial pressure on the public sector funds. Currently, almost all costs are already covered by SFA and government. The changes will make sure that the larger part of these costs will be covered by premiums of people who will now join SFV, co-insured persons, uninsured persons, privately insured persons, civil servants. These persons in general generate lower costs than the people already insured with SFV. In short, we will add premium income and not costs to SFV. Here we have the plan of approach. The project is geared towards the introduction of sustainable and quality insurance for all as of January 1st, 2024. The project consists of three work streams. One, legislative track. Two, public awareness. Three, readiness for executing, organi executing organizations. Add one, the legislative trajectory is on track we made a good progress with the legislative track in the draft LV, LBHAM, and memorandum for elucidation were finalized in November 2022, vetted by Yezet Way in December 2022, January 2023, and approved by CAM in March 2023. We now await the advice of the said Council of Public Health, after which a request for advice will be sent to the Council of Advice. The CCSU has been invited to discuss the draft and the consequence for civil servants. The intention is to present the legislation to Parliament in August in order to allow sufficient time for execution of the organization to prepare for introduction of the 1st of January 2024. Public awareness and adoption campaign is prepared. The campaign will be mixed with media, social media, and peer-to-peer -peer discussion on the optimal acceptance. Prepare execution at three, prepare execution organization. The need and gaps have been listed and change management programs are currently drafted. Now we speak of 2024. In the meantime, what the ministry has been doing, we have prepared a reparatio ordinance uh, by SRV, which deals with, for instance, common funds, the insurance of um, sole proprietors, and um, the validity of 60 plus insurance and so forth. This has been sent to the SER. Information has been received from the SER. We have sent brought it to the Council of Ministers to be sent to the Council of Advice. It has been approved by the Council of Ministers. That trajectory, you have asked the question, I will follow up to see if we received anything from the Council of Advice and I'll be able to tell you exactly where it is at this moment. But it has been approved by the Council of Ministers to be sent by the Council of Advice. Thank you, I look forward to any questions from the members of Parliament. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Members of Parliament, there's no opportunity to pose questions or make comments related to the topic of this agenda. To whom can I give the floor? Oh, I guess this was a very informative presentation, no? <laughs> uh, we have MP Westcott Williams. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the Minister again. I have taken note of the presentation given 
as well as some of the answers provided, I would like the ministers to go a little more into the process. The minister, let me back up a moment, kept stressing that this is a health and wellness plan. And I would like to know, is, it, is this still called a general health insurance is my question. Is it still called a general health insurance? One, two, can the minister tie what has been presented, especially the plan of approach, into the country package measure F3? So if the minister can, because I, again, we have received the implementation agenda for the country package for the first half year, I believe, because the, the period have changed since the signing of the mutual agreement for the execution of the, for the execution of the country package. So the implementation agenda for the second quarter, 2023, has certain steps and elements mentioned. I would like the, the minister to put those in the context of the presentation given there, because I see, for example, in this package mention being made of the fact that certain days had to be adjusted because of, and on more than one occasion, it is mentioned the legislative process. So I would like to understand that in the context of the, of the plan of, um, of approach. And I look forward to hearing from the minister where the long announced so-called reparation legislation is at, at the moment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with those two matters clarified, I would, um, I would thank you and the minister. Thank you. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Next, MP George Pantaflet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, through you, um, I want to thank the minister for the presentation. I just want to make sure that I didn't hear um, or that I heard correctly. In the presentation, the minister said and um, mentioned the issue of sustainable, affordable access to health care for all citizens. And then I, I thought I heard the minister said not all citizens. I want to make sure is it for all citizens or not all citizens, Mr. Chairman. That's one. Also, Mr. Chairman, the issue of the, of the um, affordability and so on, where the minister mentioned, and we've been headed for quite a, a long time, the issue of 400 million gillers deficit. Um, Mr. Chairman, I will again go back to the matter of immigration. Uh, controls were done by the, the Minister of Labor and the Minister of Justice, of course, in combination with other departments, <coughs> on the businesses where it was found that there were persons who are undocumented. And I believe a covenant was, was signed between the ministers in order to allow, uh, to allow persons who are undocumented and working, I think, for four or five years with an employer to request exemption where the article of the love admission and expulsion will not be um, uh, used in this instance, which means that they can get permission to remain on the island while the documents are being processed. So, Chairman, why I'm going in this direction, um, there's still... There's still businesses, and that is why I said, after this venture has been completed, I, Mr. Chairman, today would like to know exactly what are the findings, basically, because I asked the question, based on the control, how many companies were found in contravention of the law of admission and expulsion, because it would mean that the persons are not paying their taxes, they're not paying the premiums, Mr. Chairman, which means we are losing money. I'm not saying that this will completely eliminate the deficit, but I'm saying, Mr. Chairman, that basically if that information can be granted or can be, 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 be received, we can, we'll find out, Mr. Chairman, that right now, as we are sitting here, that government is still losing millions of dollars in revenues as it pertains to premiums and taxes. So I'm saying, yes, Definitely, uh, healthcare, the, the matter of, of, of the issue of healthcare, it has to be resolved, and you have to deal with the deficit that, that, that we are facing right now. But again, it should not be that we are still finding ourselves dealing with employers who are not paying their premiums, not paying their taxes. Today, today, 
I got a message from an employee. And why do I bring this up? Because, Mr. Chairman, sometimes it seems to be an isolated case, but it's not an isolated case. This employee is busy, I would say late, preparing a letter to submit to the, the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Labor requesting permission to remain on the island while the documents are being processed. The employee with whom they're working at present for the last four years, five years rather, is now telling them that they will be issued a pay slip saying they're only working three days a week, whereas they're working five days a week. Secondly, they're going to be given a contract, a contract which will expire in June next month, which means basically the employer will no longer file a request or permit for them. That is happening right now. So, Mr. Chairman, when I told him, I said, look, go and complain to the labor office as, as what is taking place. Mr. Chairman, that's, that's another situa situation altogether. What I'm saying, Mr. Chairman, it is important that the control continues when it comes to businesses or individuals that have persons employed, and they're not paying their premiums nor paying their taxes, Mr. Chairman, because as long as this is not addressed, we will continue to lose the needed money in order for government to meet its responsibilities as it pertains to health care. And I'm happy to hear uh, the issue of the sole proprietorship brought up because this is a long, is a long ongoing process. And I definitely hope that uh, in the not too distant future, the matter can be resolved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Pantaflet. MP Westcott Williams would like the floor once again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, talking about coverage and universal health coverage, general health insurance, whichever terminology we'll be using, um, brings me to the following question to the minister. Several years ago, the St. Martin Medical Center was on the brink of a financial crisis, primarily attributed to care provided to undocumented, not undocumented, uninsured persons, not necessarily undocumented, uninsured persons on St. Martin. Does the ministry have any idea if this situation exists today at the medical center in terms of outstanding healthcare services rendered? And if so, what is the extent is my follow-up question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. Are there any other members seeking the floor at this time? No. Um, Minister, I also would like to chime in on this very important topic of finding the broad and satisfying the broad sustainable healthcare needs that we need for our country. Um, the the fact that perhaps today, and especially this slide that we have before us, shows a very clear, what I interpret as a very executable timeline for solving a lot of the, or may, creating a lot of the improvements that we need within healthcare is exactly what I think is important for the committee to have. But in addition to that, I think it's important because some mention was made of, well, what might have happened before and how we got here and whether it's a name change and so on. Minister, I think it's very important that we recognize, and what I recognize in you is the approach to a lot of the things within healthcare that have somehow gone completely wrong. Somehow there was a sort of tunnel vision to do it one way or the highway. And for some reason, I think your approach where you have made some adjustments, where you perhaps you have uh, held more consultations, where in certain areas perhaps you went to the drawing board and certain areas you did keep. I think it would be good to hear from you, Minister, that sort of journey you've had to make to not have to get caught in a situation where you simply want to continue with exactly what is, how is, and just this, how I want it done, where were the level of compromises that would have had to be made from a ministry's perspective, from an SZB perspective, to reach to what we see here now, a light at the end of the tunnel for improved healthcare in St. Martin. Um, 
in addition to that, one of the things that I always recall, and, and coming into Parliament in 2018, this subject of a general health insurance was a very heated and a very divisive one within the Parliament, as was indicated. And I recall in many meetings, even not just here, but I believe it was in 2021, no, sorry, in 2017, in January, I recall there was a conference that was held where stakeholders were able to come and kind of give their feedback on this issue. Um, I think, I believe Ms. Arnell might recall that, and I think you might have been there, I'm not sure. But that event, I think I have it right here, it was, because this is, and the, the information is on the PJ, it was at Divi Little Bee Resort, January 27, 2017. That conference really, let's say for my person at the time, I was actually in the tourist bureau and we wanted to understand what was really this whole implication. And at that point, even before be, being a member of parliament, I saw where if you do not find a way to address the issues of all sectors involved in trying to create something, you're not going to succeed. You can feel like you have, oh, I got a parliament on my side, I got a government, I got this. It is not going to work. And I, I predicted that and I saw that, and I saw that once again in 2018, when even within the coalition that was backing this minister, there was some doubt as to whether this can work. I say that, Mr. Minister, because I want to applaud your approach to first of all, separating some of this, what I consider the controversial or the hot issues. For example, mention was made of the sole proprietors being insured, um, the management of the fund, the issue of raising the limit, those in that conference were the three main things that I saw coming out like, yeah, I, we, we like everything in the general health insurance, but we're not sure about that as a V limit. We like what you're going with the general health insurance, but how are you going to manage the fund? And what I think you've done is allow those aspects to be handled individually to not sully the work of the improvements that will be brought from healthcare insurance that is now coming to parliament. And I think that was an important part of what makes this whole process a lot more palatable for many of the stakeholders involved and perhaps even the members of parliament when it comes to that point. So it would be good, Minister, if you can see if you concur with that sort of analysis. And again, I think a other point that constantly seems to be coming up, and I want to make sure that at least from my position that it's made clear, whether a general health insurance is in a country package or not, would Minister Otley have ensured that we are where we are today? Because I don't believe we are here because of a country package. I know that general health insurance is in a country package because of the efforts of the ministry, not the other way around. And it's unfortunate if that picture, this sort of reference to the country package is to say, well, they put in the country package, so now you had to do it. Please explain the level of consultation, the level of input that the ministry had to give to the Teweo and not the other way around to make sure that these targets are the targets that the ministry is comfortable with, that the content is something that the ministry believes is what it should be. And also, sometimes it's mentioned that the country package is just, let's say, a product of the Dutch government. But when I look within the national development vision, when I look within the governing program, everything I see related to healthcare reform is right there. So again, please elaborate that the country package is not the birth or the solution in and of itself. It is something that the Ministry of VSA has targeted. You are on target. We hope that this can become a reality. And I think it's very important for that context to be given as well. As is mentioned, this is something um, that I think is interesting parallels to the hospital, where in 2014, there was announcement by the UP party about we want to build a new hospital. There was also about healthcare reforms. There was a change in government and we were going in the right direction. And all of a sudden, we changed directions. And because of tunnel vision, I believe personally, all those years were lost. Minister, I think I applaud you today for not having that sort of tunnel vision and opening up to hear the members of parliament, the stakeholders, your ministry, and everyone involved to get us where we are today. I see MP Westcott Williams would like the floor. You have the floor. Thank you once again, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a brief follow-up to my question 
regarding the outstandings for care for uninsured persons. As the minister, I'm sure, would know, the institutions such as PAHO continue to report the um, uninsured segment of our population at 30%. We have heard that number here on St. Martin as well. Does the minister have any update where that is concerned, that number is concerned? Are there any more recent figures? As I mentioned in PAHO's report, um, latest report, latest country report, I believe, they mentioned that percentage. 30% of the population is uninsured, and they also then tie in the public health budget to our GDP at 2%. Talking about the PAHO, and again, in the latest PAHO report, St. Martin is cited to have an outstanding debt to PAHO at close to 100,000 guilders. And that is something listed in their report, I believe, of March this year. And I would like, one, the government to um, look into that. I see some of the minister's um, staff shaking their heads, and but I, I have that report open in front of me. The Pan American Health Organization, as of March 14, 2023, St. Martin, over the period 21 through 23, and that total amounts to 99,933 guilders. That's their report. And um, so I want the government to take note of that if that is not correct. If it is correct, to see how quickly it can be addressed, one, and if it is not correct, that um, contact be made for it to be corrected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott-Williams. And next, we have MP Pantaflet. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just a remark and a, and a question. Um, I just want to say this to persons who might be following who are undocumented, because some might not know. Being undocumented does not mean that your employer should not register you at SFV. In the time past, you had to get your documents, but now that's not the case. So. Don't let your employer tell you because you're undocumented that you cannot get SSV coverage because that is not the truth. That's one. Mr. Chairman, the, the minister during his presentation mentioned um, the issue of persons um, don't have access to public funds. I kind of missed the trend of the, of the presentation, so if that can be explained, that persons don't have access to public funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. Are there any other members of parliament requiring the floor at this time? Okay, members of parliament, I will adjourn for two minutes to caucus with the minister because we also have to have discussed the way forward for agenda one and we'll return in two minutes. Good afternoon once again, members of parliament. We
had a discussion with the minister. He indicated that he would need approximately half an hour. I rounded it up to 5.30 p.m., where the minister will return to answer the questions in Agenda 3, as well as then we go to Agenda 1. And uh, with that, hopefully, we'll be able to conclude this meeting today. So meeting is adjourned until 5.30 p.m.
Good afternoon once again to the members of parliament of the committee and of course our honorable minister in his cabinet. At this time, we'll turn the floor over to the minister to answer questions that were posed to him. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know it's getting pretty late, so I jump right into the questions. The first question by MP Sarah West. <laughs> it's not late? Okay, good. First question by MP Sarah Westcott William. Is it still called general health insurance? In essence, MP, it is a general health insurance. However, we think it was important to market it as what it is, an improved ordinance regulating access and financing of health care. Contact the min can the minister tie what has been presented to country package measure F3? The approach is tied to country package. It was actually a strategic move by the ministry because it was one way to guarantee that the ministry uses the country package as a tool to be able to access expertise, support, and resources to ensure that this gets done. Where is the Reparatsi ordinance? It's on its way to the Council of Advice. It has been approved by the Council of Ministers and on its way to the Council of Advice. Does the ministry have any idea on the situation that exists today in terms of the outstanding health care services rendered? Yes, the situation does exist today at approximately 6 million guilders. This is pertaining to the SMMC. Does the minister have an update? Does the minister have an update on the update of uninsured numbers? We are awaiting the finalization of the census results for an accurate data of uninsured population. What is the status of our payment to PAHO? Membership fees are made and are up to date. What is outstanding are the payments we're relating to vaccinations. However, the advice has currently been approved to issue these payments. MP George Pantaflet, is it for all citizens? It is for all, yes, it is for all citizens. Oh, over here. Yes, it is for all citizens. <laughs> What are we? What are the findings? How many companies were found in not compliance? Um, at this moment, we are not able to give the exact answer on that. On that um, next question, explain how persons don't have access to public health funds. These are persons who do not qualify based on requirements of ZV, where we speak of public funds. MP Bryson, what is, what is the journey you had to make? What were the level of compromises you had to make to reach here? Do you concur with the analysis? Whether a GHI is in the country package or not, would Minister Atley ensure, did Minister Atley ensure that it is here today? Please elaborate on the Lance Paqueta is not the birth of the solution. Health reform has always been my priority, as stated once taken office as Minister of Health. I understand the importance in making sure that the necessary changes that are required to guarantee access to proper health care would have been made. I jumped at the opportunity for country packages to ensure that all my priorities were included. This included COVID PPE, hospitainers, guaranteeing that the health care funds would be in better managed. This was done by increasing the wage limits, the reparation ordinance that we speak about, and the introduction of Artly Care. Other projects that are included in the country package include mental health and public health law. The biggest factor was understanding the cultural aspects and understanding that this could not be forced down the throats of Parliament nor the people of St. Martin. Important to mention in our approach was based on lesson learned approach and we look at what was done before and how we can improve and do differently. We, ex we had extensive involvement with stakeholders and their participation and their concerns were taken along. Some of the most important changes that were made thus far, just some, is that there is now an opt-out opportunity, but we take solidarity into account. 
there's a check and balances on government paying their contribution, government paying premiums instead of bills to better manage the cost. Citizens are now automatically entitled to access to health care, which this was not the case before. Data exchange is one of the major key to success, um, especially between civil registry, tax department, and SVA. This is one of the bottlenecks that was done before. There are also many numerous changes that were made to this legislation to help it be more culturally friendly and adaptable that we believe for the country of St. Martin. Um, at the end of the day, I would like to publicly thank everyone that was involved from the beginning to where we are today. Um, and I think that once it reaches parliament with the scrutiny of parliament, I really think that we can make the much needed change to the healthcare situation in St. Martin and finally bring access and affordable healthcare to the people of St. Martin. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I look forward to any clarifications. Thank you, Minister Otley, for the answers to the question posed. I look to the left, to the members of the committee. I see Member of Parliament, Sarah Scott Williams, you want the floor? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the Minister for the answers provided to brief clarifications, if possible. One, I assume, nearly no, that the law has been drafted. I'm talking the, yes, the law has been drafted for the medical insurance or the general health insurance or universal health insurance. Um, could the minister give me the, how it is called in Dutch? Because I guess if the legislation is drafted, it's drafted in Dutch, so what would be the name? The minister gave the name in English so, but I would like to know how it is, um, what is, what is it called in Dutch? What is the legislation called in Dutch is one, is my um, first clarification and or request. And secondly, can the minister explain better the issue of the um, amounts owed for vaccinations? So was that an agreement that um, we would be calling on PAHO where necessary for vaccinations and we did that or did they supply an amount um, per year? The, the amounts are pretty, no, not, I can't say pretty much the same per year, but so can some further clarification be given about that agreement that led to the outstanding of approximately 100,000 for I believe three years. Um, those two matters to be clarified. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member of Parliament, Sir Rescott Williams. I look, is there any other member of the committee that requires a floor? No? Well, I turn again to Honorable Minister. Do you need a few minutes? Uh, I'll adjourn for five minutes. Mr. will adjourn until 5.46.
Good afternoon once again. I hereby resume this meeting and I turn the floor over to the minister. Minister Oakley, you have the floor. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Arnell. Thank you. Yes, you do. Uh, Ms. Arnell, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Um, in response to MP Westcott, the ordinance in, the, the, in Dutch, it's called Landsverordening Houdende Regeling van de Verplichte Uniforme Verzekering <coughs> Tegen Ziektekosten. That's the Dutch term. And to <coughs> the response pertaining to the outstanding for PAHO, or for the calendar years 22 and 2023. Thank you very much. Um, Member Parliament, that's good. You have the floor. Yes, Mr. Chairman. With respect to, oh, thank you. With respect to the last um, question, so, but what exactly was the understanding for the vaccinations, with the vaccinations? So you give me the two years that it's for, so, but what, yeah, what about vaccinations in those years? How was that agreement? Ms. Anneli, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yes, you have the floor. In the immunization vaccines that we get every year for our population of St. Martin, for the, 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 no to, to 17, the children, the zero to 17 year old, and that is part of our, of our fa vaccine revolving fund that we receive annually from PAHO. Thank you very much, Ms. Arnell, for your response. I don't see any more remarks or questions. I want to thank the minister for the questions answered to that were the answers that were answered to the question posed on this agenda point three, and I hereby close this agenda point. We now go over to agenda point one, which was agreed definitely that we would um, go back to it and ensure that the questions that were posed during that agenda point are answered. Is the minister ready to answer those questions? Then minister proceed with the answering of the questions. Yes, sir. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I move right into the questions pertaining to agenda point one with the vaping. MP Sarah Westcott, has the interministerial group platform been officially established? Yes, the interministerial work group has been officially established via Council of Ministers. If this is, has been done, um, what is the plan of approach? What timeline do we look at? The plan of approach is set to develop by quarter three of 2023. The step survey is planned to be executed simultaneously in accordance, in accordance with the interstitial work group. So it will also take place quarter three, 2023. MP always also asked about cost factor. This will um, be developed alongside the plan of approach. Um, MP Duiva, is there a policy for smoking in public areas? There's a legislation on smoking in public spaces, national degree regulating tobacco use. It prohibits smoking in healthcare institutions, during social, cultural spaces, sports spaces, educational facilities, etc. This does not include vaping, but we, Minister, strongly feels that it should include vaping as stated that vaping can exhibit secondhand effects as well, and the nicotine in vaping can have the same harm as cigarettes. MP Pantaflet, how dangerous is smoking for our youth? Has a survey been done? What is done, what is considered more dangerous, smoking or vaping? Smoking and vaping are both dangerous alike. No survey has been done at this moment, MP. However, um, for us to distinguish which one is more dangerous at the moment, it, it's not um, scientifically proven. What is proven is that both smoking and vaping have detrimental effects to your lungs and to your health. What we can say is an opinion, um, reason why vaping can be considered a bit more dangerous is the fact that when persons vape, they don't necessarily are not cognizant of the fact of the 
dangers or the harm that is being done to their body and the fact that they think it's not as dangerous as cigarettes allow them to vape more frequently throughout the day than a person would smoke a cigarette. MP Bryson, I concur that we should look at the, at the national decree on labeling of food stuff to create labels to warn, um, for our, warn our society on what our society need. So MP Bryson had more of a comment and I concur with his comment. And that was it um, on behalf of VESA received for vaping. Thank you very much, Minister, for the answers to the questions. I now turn to my left and I see that Member of Parliament, Sir Rescott Williams, you require the floor. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just briefly as a follow up question to the Minister's statement, thanks. I think that has covered also those that were posed to the Minister of, at least by me, Minister of Education. However, the matter of the inter ministerial uh, um, group team. Um, has that decision by the Council of Ministers been formalized in a national decree of any kind? And if so, can that be shared with Parliament? So that decree, that is it a lanceslet? Is it and can that be shared with Parliament? Is my question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member of Parliament, Sir Rescott Williams. I look to my right and I give the Minister the floor. You have the floor, Minister Hartley. Thank you. Um, it is in process. Um, the calm. We do have a calm decision. On it, the group um, has started their preliminary trajectory, but what you are asking for is in process, MP Westcott. Thank you, Minister. I look to my left. No other remarks or suggestions. I would like to thank the Honourable Minister. Sorry. All right, I'm going to adjourn for three minutes. Meeting adjourn. I hereby resume the meeting and I give the floor to the Honourable Minister. Minister Otley, you have the floor. Okay, perfect. I hereby answer the questions on behalf of the Honourable Minister of Education. MP Sarah Westcott, can the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports share the proposal received by the Alpha Leo Club and the Youth Parliament? 
To the Honorable MP via the chair, the meeting was held with the Alpha Leo Club and the Youth Parliament was of a discussion nature and we basically agreed to look into the law and focus on the awareness. The next question from MP Sarah Westcott was on the basis of the interministerial um, group in which I answered, but I go ahead. The interministerial group was agreed upon during the Council of Ministers. This group will be meeting to discuss the plan of approach and timeline and budget will be assessed during the process. MP Duncan, to the Minister of Education in particular, I would like to know, has the ministry reached out to schools, guidance counselor in particular, because we are talking about addiction and we're talking about mental health issues and schools need the much support. As mentioned earlier by the Minister of Education MP, schools were previously provided with information on vaping, its risk, and possible signals that a student might be vaping. It is our intention to continue this process though student support services through, sorry, they forgot the R, through the Student Support Services Division. Thank you, Minister, for the answers to the question posed. I look to my left. Any other member of the committee requires the floor? No? No one? Uh, I, would I would like to thank the Honourable Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labour, Minister Otley, and of course his support staff for the answers provided to the question posed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this meeting. I thank you all for your participation, and I hereby close this meeting.